Welcome to the Gospel Liberty Podcast. Thanks for joining us for another episode. And I have Pastor Martin Medina back with me in the studio. How's it going? Oh, it's going so good. Yeah, I've been enjoying some good food and foul strip out here. Yeah. No doubt. So yeah. glad we get to uh, record another one of these. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's such a good time. Just, you know, it's like we're just hanging out, talking, chatting. Yeah, half the time we say, oh, we should have recorded that one, you know? Exactly. Some <laughs> of the best ones happen offline, am I right? Right, yep. So in this episode, we want to talk about the universal church and the local church Mm -hmm. and the relationship between the two. This is something that has been on my mind, on my heart, really for many years. And uh, particularly in, you know, the last months, the last several months, I've been thinking a lot about it as well. And something that it's, it's very helpful for all of us as Christians to think through these things because it really practically impacts how we live our life and how we view other brothers and sisters in Christ, how we make our decisions regarding how we're going to spend our our time and what we think our responsibilities are before Christ Mm -hmm. um, to other brothers, sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ as we live life in this age. So maybe you can help us out and just kind of start with the definition of terms. Uh, What would you say the scriptures say are is the universal church versus the local church? What are the, uh, the differences there? Yeah, I think the universal church means that everyone will be saved. No, that, <laughs> that's not what the universal Universalism. church. Universalism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I think the, the, the universal church, you know, as it's taught in scripture, is essentially that all who have ever been saved uh, or will be saved by uh, Christ. Um, so in some sense, there's there's a, a, a part of the universal church already in glory. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's as it pertains to this age and, and, and this life, um, yeah, it would be everyone who is truly in Christ, who has been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the, of the beloved, mm-hmm. you know. And so that would make up the universal church. It is, um, you know, as they say, invisible by nature because uh, it's it's not um, a, a locale that, that's visibly seen as a congregation. So it, it's all the saints uh, who profess and are truly saved by Christ. That would be the most simplest terms. Um, and I, I think you see that in Hebrews 12 about, you know, talking about heavenly Zion, you know, mm. you've come to something that cannot be touched. Mm-hmm. And, you t- you know, you see so many elements of, of the believers are coming to uh, Mount Zion mm-hmm. and they're even joined in with the heavenly host. Uh, so, yeah, the, the universal church is anyone who's truly in Christ um, as it pertains to this life. It's those who are your brothers and sisters in the Lord who've mm-hmm. been united to Christ and therefore we should be united to each other. Now, the the... The local church, or the what they would call the visible church, is as it is expressed through different congregations, where the church is administering the Lord's Supper and baptism, where Christ is preached, where there's a community, a covenant community that has covenanted together to be part of a church that meets in the same location at the mm-hmm. same time, and there's a sense where those pastors are in charge of those members of that church. And those members uh, are called to, you know, glorify God in their role of that local church Mm -hmm. to those uh, specific pastors. So those visible um, local churches, it's a it's just a visible representation of the universal Mm -hmm. church in different locales. Uh, Yeah, I think that would be as as simple as I could put it. Yeah, Yeah, I think that's a very helpful summary. So then we think about, okay. am I I'm a I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. If you're a Christian, listen to this episode. Um, Do you see yourself primarily, first and foremost, as a member of the universal church or as a member of a specific local church? Or how do you think about that when it comes to uh, how I should see which one takes priority or are they the same pretty much in, you know, one isn't primary over the other. They just have different expressions. How do we think through, uh, you know, I'm a member of both, but should I be thinking of myself primarily as a member of one and secondarily a member of the other? Yeah, no, I think that that's a very uh, helpful question. Um, I would say that we should primarily see ourselves as uh, members of the universal church. And I think that would uh, help us to, to foster a much more kindred and ecumenical spirit. Um, and, you, and it would help us to not uh, wrongly divide over things because you're seeing primarily what what joins you to other believers is not uh, even and this might scare some but it's not even theology mm. uh, it's not uh, even doctrine those those things are very important uh, i don't want to be misquoted there but primarily what joins you to other believers is christ himself Amen. and and you know i think one um puritan 
said, you know, Christ is like the great, great magnet. And the more that we draw nearer to Christ, the more we draw nearer to each other. Mm. But it's Christ that, that we're drawn to. So I think if we could uh, shift our minds to say, okay, I think uh, Christianity needs to remember that it is one kingdom, mm-hmm. one body, mm-hmm. one baptism, right? All that Amen. Paul talks about there in Ephesians 4 is this oneness of mind. And I don't think he's just talking to the church at Ephesus. Mm-hmm. I think he's laying down that principle for all of God's people mm-hmm. there. Um, and yeah, so I think that, that should take precedence. And then that actually creates a healthier environment for the local church and mm-hmm. your commitment to the local church and helps you to maintain uh, good relationships and good friendships outside of your own local mm-hmm. church and guard you from things like sectarianism mm-hmm. or, you know, a fractured, tribalism, yeah, tribalism a mm-hmm. fractured Christian, uh, you know, movement. And I think Christ said it well, you know, a house divided cannot stand. Mm-hmm. And I would say that I think Christianity is very much uh, divided over everything these days. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if you, what, what you would add to that. I've, I fully agree with that. I think that one of the temptations is to, because we can see the the Christians that are part of our same local church and because we have a, you know, a shared mission statement that's actually, you know, written down by, by human beings and because we have a, a shared leaders in, in the eldership of, of the church, I think it's very easy to become uh, prideful and sectarian and uh, kind of a, have this mindset of we are the ones who are doing the work for uh, the Lord and the other ones, yeah, they might be doing some good work, but you know, we're the ones that are kind of the center of God's kingdom at our particular local church. And I think that's extremely dangerous and something that we need to protect against. Of course, we think that our local church is, uh, you know, a wonderful, otherwise we wouldn't join it. Hopefully mm-hmm. you wouldn't join a church that, that you don't think is a, a wonderful church overall, but we have to guard against it because there's many dangers that, uh, that come up. First of all, we can think that, uh, we can start to look down on other Christians who have very minor differences with right. us and we can start to see them as the enemy. And, uh, you know, for example, what if there's another church that is, uh, being planted right down the road from where your church meets and is your, what is your first thought there as a pastor or as a Christian is your first thought, Oh, this is wonderful. This is another uh, local congregation that I'm on the same team with. This is great. Or is your thought, oh, it's a, it's competition. Kind of like if, you know, there's a McDonald's and then, oh no, all of a sudden a Taco Bell opens up right next to the McDonald's and the McDonald's is thinking, oh, okay. Our competitor just opened right. down the street. Yeah. Is that how we should be thinking about churches? What do you think? No, definitely not. Yeah. You know I mean? Like, again, insofar as that church has being planted is Trinitarian mm-hmm. and affirms all the essentials. Pr- of the the primary. Yep. 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 I think once you see that, um, yeah, hey, these guys are on the same team as us. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, these guys are, are are for Christ. They're preaching a biblical gospel, mm-hmm. and they are holding to sound uh, truths that are from, from scriptures. And I think it's like you should be that other church's biggest cheerleader, mm. you know. And, and, and rather than seeing it as competition, I think, again, this would— this is what, what I think would really help the kingdom of Christ continue to spread on the face of the earth is that so many times, you know— it, the, 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 the scriptures are, are, are chock full of uh, spiritual war mm-hmm. language and, and fighting language and, um, you know, this soldier-like mentality. And I think that Christians have so much infighting or division or friendly fire that they're really almost like impotent in the world because they're just so concerned of looking at each other and pointing literally their spiritual guns at each other. Yes. Rather than it being like a hey, like yeah, we sure we disagree in these areas, mm-hmm. but I'm your biggest cheerleader. Lord willing, you'll be mine. Let's advance this kingdom for Christ and His glory. Mm-hmm. Rather than saying, well, I don't like them. Are they gonna take members from us? It's just coming. You know, right. that, that's like you're literally forgetting who the enemy is and and whose side uh, you're on. You it's know? it's so true. And if you think about an analogy, like think of think of D Day in World War Two and the Allied forces. So you have you know, the, the U.S. Navy, you have the U.S. Army, you have the U.S. Army Air Corps, which would you know, later become the, the Air Force, and you have the, parat- the paratroopers, and they're all a part of this, you know, grand operation to defeat the, the enemies of, of Nazi Germany, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And what if, uh, you know, it's, it's D-Day, June 6, 1944, and then all of a sudden the, the, the Big Red One, the, the first army of, of the U.S., you know, comes in contact with some paratroopers, 
on the beach and start saying, oh yeah, the, the, these guys are, are horrible, or inland, and they start thinking, oh yeah, these guys are horrible. No, they're, they realize, yeah, we're, we're different. We're in a different division. We have, a, um, in, in some ways we're different, but we're fighting for the same goal. We're yes. fighting for, mm-hmm. for the same purpose. And, uh, you know, if the Navy started fighting against the, the army, how horrible is that? Yeah, yes, exactly. there's differences here, but uh, we are all on the same team mm-hmm. working for the same mission. And we need to start seeing ourselves uh, on the same team rather than opposing teams. Yeah, yeah, correct. And, and you could let some of those important differences manifest themselves. And you know, sure, the way that you would give resources mm-hmm. or the way that you would partner up to maybe do conferences or things of that nature. Some of some of that stuff is fine. You don't. We're not saying you need to join arms with Correct. you know the, the Pentecostal church on the street. And you it, don't need to affirm everything yes, they do exactly. Yeah. But still have that kindred spirit where it's like. But at the end of the day, because of the centrality of Christ and His gospel, mm-hmm. we're brothers and sisters yes. in, in Christ. And ultimately, we're going to be spending eternity with each other. Yep. Uh, so we don't need to wait till heaven for mm-hmm. us to have unity, yep. you know? Amen. And, and unless we sound like we're downplaying doctrinal differences or downplaying the importance of the specifics of, you know, Reformed theology, which you and I would both yes, hold to yes. with joy, we're not doing that whatsoever. We need to be able to learn to say, no, I think that you're incorrect and you're wrong. And I think that this is harmful in X, Y, Z way. This secondary, this tertiary doctrine is harmful in whatever way. And yet I can also say that I love you and I appreciate you and I want uh, you to succeed as you are preaching the gospel. And I want people to get saved and get built up in Christ in whatever way they can at your at your local church. We need to be able to say both. And it's not that if you are concerned about building unity with other true Christians and recognizing the the joys of the universal church that you think that, you know, uh, secondary and tertiary doctrinal differences don't matter. They matter a lot and we should care about them and we should discuss them and talk about them and um, and we should at home hold firm to our convictions while also recognizing that we should be uniting around the, the primaries and keeping the main thing the main thing. Yeah, yeah. Some of the godliest men that I've, that I've known or have come across have been the most uh, ecumen- ecumenical men in the right sense, men yes. in the right sense of that term, uh, not joining arms with unbelievers, mm-hmm. but seeking to, hey, is there ways where we can join arms even though we disagree on vitally important things, mm-hmm. you know? I, I think of, you know, even like Joel Beakey, you know, mm-hmm. Joel Beakey is a pedo Baptist. Um, he has a pedo Baptist uh, seminary mm-hmm. and yet he's willing to, uh, he had an influx of reformed Baptist students at his seminary mm-hmm. and he said, Hey, we're not trying to convert them to pedo Baptism. Why don't we get some reformed Baptists to set up something where these guys can take classes. And so he calls a reformed Baptist seminary and says, Hey, would you be interested in offering some reformed Baptist material for these students? And let, can our seminaries work together? Yes. And that is such a beautiful kindred spirit Amazing. rather than, you know, trying to, okay, this is my opportunity to convert, you know, these reformed Baptists to pedo Baptists right. and make that the end all be all. And it's like, ugh, like we're fighting a culture war. Mm. There's, there's such a prevailing darkness in our culture mm-hmm. and Christians are over here. Uh, Turning the guns on each other. Yeah. Yeah. And o- o- over a, Otherwise, you know, things that could be, hey, when, when there's peace, let's talk about this stuff mm-hmm. more extensively. Right. But right now, it's we need all the the, the, the ammunition, all the, the brotherhood mm-hmm. and all the unity that we can get to really push back against uh, the kingdom of darkness. And I think um, even with that in mind, like, I think it'd be helpful, you know, for you to kind of give us uh, a breakdown of what you even mm-hmm. think the kingdom of, uh, kingdom of God is yes. as it pertains to the universal and the local church. Mm-hmm. Is is that is the kingdom of God synonymous with that, or is there uh, a fuller expression of the kingdom of God? Amen. Yeah, so that, that's a that's a great question. I think that th- there's one you know group of folks who we love dearly, of course, who kind of you know uh, equates the kingdom of God with the church. Mm-hmm. That this that the church is equivalent to the kingdom of God, and I, I don't think that is correct biblically. I think that the kingdom of God is His power, authority, and rule over all of creation, Mm -hmm. which is demonstrated in people and individuals wherever Christ is honored and obeyed as Lord and where the Spirit of God is working. So that the the kingdom of God can manifest itself in a a business, in a Christian business. The kingdom of God is manifest in a Christian family, 
in a Christian individual as he is, you know, playing a, a sport or what, whatever it is, wherever Christ is honored and obeyed as Lord and where the spirit of God is working is where the kingdom of God is present. And when we equate that with the, the church and even, you know, more particular with a specific local church or one specific denomination or what, th- that is where we fall into, into grave error because uh, we have to recognize that not all of Christ's eggs are in one basket. Yes. Mm-hmm. And yes, the church is essential. I'm not downplaying right. the role of the church to you know, manifest the, the glory of God in the heavenly places you know, with, with Ephesians 3. And I'm not downplaying um, the, the central role that the church has in being the pillar and buttress of the truth and of being the, uh, one of the primary means that the Lord uses to advance the gospel in the world by any means. Uh, so it's not a matter of downplaying that. It's a matter of recognizing that the Lord works in many different arenas, many different spheres to manifest the glory of Christ. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we need to recognize that so we don't become imbal- imbalanced and think that the church is the only part of our Christian life. Have you seen folks think that? And it, yeah, 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 exactly. I think that that's the danger is when there's a conflating of the kingdom of God with specifically the local church, then that's where you tend to get more of a, of a, uh, yeah, like the, like the lack of balance and you become kind of sectarian or tribalistic because you think, well, this is the only way, this is the true expression. This is where I'm being spiritual. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. And then that's what we want to guard against, you know, but on the same, in, in that same sentiment, I also want to say that we want to guard against uh, this, uh, pendulum swing of the other direction and saying, I don't need to be part of a local church right. because I am the church, so to yes. speak. And that there's a, there's a lack of seeing the importance of the local church. And, and I think we, you and I have spoken extensively about this reality. I think Christianity is about having the right gospel balance yes. of every situation, mm-hmm. you know, and sadly, I think that people tend to live their lives in pendulums mm-hmm. where it's like the church doesn't matter. And then they swing to the other pendulum where it's, the church is the only thing the, the local everything. church is the only thing that matters mm-hmm. or even the church itself and and you lose the season you lose some of the joy of uh, of christ seeing his kingdom advance even uh, outside the walls of the local church so yes. to speak um so yeah i think i, I want to guard against both mm-hmm. of those i think i think this what, what we're talking about in this podcast is kind of like the 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 safeguarding against that saying the lo- the local church is important mm-hmm. The universal church is important, and the kingdom of God is able to spread even outside those things, the, those areas when Christians are advancing the kingdom wherever Christ is being brought to bear. Amen. On life. Amen. I, I think that's exactly right. So, so the, I, from my own perspective, you know, I uh, we, we want to say that the parachurch parachurch organizations are not the same thing as the church. Yep. And the, the Lord set up the church with uh, officers, with elders and deacons, and with what you said, that the marks of a true church, the right preaching of the word, right administration of, of the sacraments, uh, uh, fellowship, um, under the uh, watch and care of elders who are keeping watch over the souls of those that the Lord has, has entrusted them to, a uh, specific covenant, joined by a covenant of discipline and witness who meet together regularly mm-hmm. under the preaching of the word of God, to quote the catechism. So... Um, you know, I had, from my personal situation, I had a misunderstanding of uh, what Christian community was. When I first got saved, I thought the local church, you know, wasn't that important at all. So, and, and then I started getting into some folks who taught me rightly about the importance of the local church, but then I swung the pendulum. I'm not saying they had wrong teaching, these, these guys I was listening to, but I swung the pendulum to think that the local church now is everything. This is where I get my Christian community exclusively. Mm. I don't know if I would have said that out loud, but in practice, that's how I was living. That kind of, you know, if you weren't, everything needed to be filtered through my local church mm-hmm. and everything needed to be filtered through the elders because they were the ones in authority and everything needed to be, uh, you know, a, a, an official church activity. Um, connected to my specific local church that I was a member of so I could make sure that it was under the oversight of, of elders. And uh, once again, in general, it's good to, once again, I'm not downplaying the uh, wonderful nature and the special uh, uh, relationship that you have with those who you share this this covenant community with in, in the same local church. But 
when you have that exclusive mindset, it starts to become extremely unhealthy and right. cultish and unbiblical. So if you think about, uh, I, I went back and I looked at and examined my thought about the New Testament epistles and who are they addressed to. So often I think that folks who rightly love the local church as we should and think that the local church is extremely important as we should, can think that they can think that the New Testament epistles were written to one specific local church and that everything was in a local church context. So for example, when you see in, uh, in, uh, Romans 12, you know, the command, like love one another or something, you think that that means, Oh, okay. This is addressed to a, a local church. So therefore this is calling me to love those in my local church or in, in Ephesians, uh, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Ephesians four thirty two. We can think that that okay, that's what I do to those in my local church. I should be kind to those in my local church, tenderhearted, forgiving those in my local church. I should one another with those in my local church, and that's certainly true. We should be one anothering with those in our local church. But Romans isn't addressed to one specific local church. If you look at who it's addressed to, it says to all the saints who are in Rome. Now, at the time, was there more than one church in Rome? Was there only one specific local church with elders in Rome? I think that's up for debate. Or same thing with uh, Ephesians, to the saints who are in Ephesus. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say to the one church that's in mm-hmm. Ephesus. Now, to Corinth, to the, ch- to the Corinthians, it's addressed to the church at Corinth, the singular church. Or Thessalonians, it's, just, it's addressed to the singular church at Thessalonica. Uh, Colossians is to the saints at Colossae. Or Galatians is to the churches of Galatia. So mm-hmm. these different, uh, or First uh, Peter is addressed to the elect exiles, you know, throughout the dispersion mm-hmm. in a bunch of different regions. And so that's not addressed to one sp- specific local church. So what I'm saying is the one another commands in the New Testament, if you exclusively think of those things as belonging to, as commanding you to relate to folks in your own local church community this way, that is too narrow of a view. Yep. Mm-hmm. It is true that you that these are you are to do this in the context of a local church. Mm-hmm. Amen. But it's also to all of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm-hmm. Should you be kind and tender hearted to those in your local church, but then to your other brother and sister in Christ who you live right next door to, who goes to a different local church than you? Oh, I don't have to be kind and tender hearted to him. Mm-hmm. I don't have to forgive him as God in yeah. Christ forgave mm-hmm. me because he's not a part of my covenant community. Mm-hmm. No, actually he is because there's one shepherd over the universal church and yeah. his name is Jesus. Amen. And Jesus is the chief shepherd of the flock. And if you, like you said, all true Christians are united in Christ and under his lordship, and he's the head of the church. So when it says, uh, you know, what, when we have these one another commands, yes, we live them out within our local church context uh, much of the time because we see those people more often and we, you know, go to certain church, official church functions more often. But also, do I think about how I am also living out these one another commands to people outside of my, my local church? What yeah. do you think about everything? Oh, it's said. solid. Yeah, it's almost like I feel like I'm just sitting, in, you know, under the sage council <laughs> of the wisest brother I've ever met. So yeah, there's literally no. like it's just yeah, like, that's that you know the last you know three to five minutes. Mm-hmm. I think that hits exactly what mm-hmm. we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And I think as I've stated, I think that is the most gospel centered view, but most importantly, the most biblical view. Yes. And Christ like, exalting. Yeah, right? exactly. And it and again, it really um, just sets an emphasis on being united to Christ and mm-hmm. each other, not merely because we're in the same place on Sundays, mm-hmm. but, but because we're united to Christ and what he's done for us. And that opens up the door to just such joy and unity and fellowship. And like you said, yeah, most of the time the, it's going to be expressed in the local church because mm-hmm. that's who we're around the most. Mm-hmm. And so we know uh, the most, um, you know, intimately. And, yeah. And, and who we sh- should be sharing the most closely, uh, close theological truths in common. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, that's where the leaders are said over the membership. So there's, there's those dynamics that, yeah, you won't be able to find in the universal church, but that doesn't negate the necessity of those commands to the broader, uh, universal church and how there's still imperatives for the Christians to, to hold to those things. You know, I've often thought like, you know, if you were at war, let's just say Vietnam, right? Mm-hmm. And you got, you know, separated from, from your, 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 your platoon, boys. Yep, yeah. Your, your, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're, you're hiding out, 
you don't want to move, you're scared, and you hear, you know, footsteps approaching, mm-hmm. and you begin to grow fearful because you think, oh, is this the enemy? Is this the enemy? And you know, you peek through the bush and you see, it's allies. It's mm-hmm. it's your it's it's actually your mm-hmm. men. You wouldn't think, oh, okay, well. I don't know them that well, so I'll just let them. Even if you've right. never met them, yep. you, you know they have the right uniform mm-hmm. on. You would be jumping for joy because yep. now you're a lot safer. Yes. Now you're in a lot uh, a better place because now you're not alone. You're not stranded. You found your guys that are on your team. You'd be jumping for joy, you mm-hmm. know. And sadly, with Christians, as it were, in the public square, mm-hmm. it's like you could literally meet someone who's a brother in the Lord mm-hmm. and doesn't really phase you that much rather right. than being excited and thankful. Like, Hey, this guy's on my team, you know, yes. Christ bought him with his blood and being excited to get to know him, uh, share a few words, with him, even if it's just in passing, you know, mm-hmm. or if you see someone that's faithfully preaching the gospel out in public, you should, I always think you should make it a point to go talk to them and yes. say, Hey, thanks for being out mm-hmm. here or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. just those elements I think are missing in that, in this Christian um, Christendom, mm-hmm. that is, it, that's why there probably is no Christendom a- yes. anymore because it's we don't see each other as that one kingdom, yep. that that one bride, that one body united to each other in Christ. You right. know? Yep. No, I think that's solid. You know, I think if we can recover this, I think that this will do great damage to the kingdom of darkness. Mm. And I think Satan would hate to see the Christian church unite around the person and work of Christ. Amen. And loving one another Mm -hmm. across local church lines, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we've talked about and we've kind of used this phrase that Christians in local churches are under elder are under the care of elders or our uh, elders have a certain charge Mm -hmm. oversight. um, Yeah. Oversight. Can you help us to understand what exactly that means? What does it mean practically on the ground that uh, if I am a part of a local church, if I'm a member of a local church, that I'm under the authority of this pastor. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, I think you had to like share your bank statements with that pastor. No, I'm just <laughs> like, <laughs> sadly, yeah. I think yeah. I think that get does a, happen. Get approval for your <laughs> what dinner you're eating. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, your your pastor needs to uh, write out your budget for you. Right. You know, no, no, the, I'm totally joking. I, I, but I do think that probably does happen in some mm. churches. Sadly, mm. um, I think that yeah, you spoke a little bit about sphere sovereignty. I think there's, um, you know, the, the the sphere of the local church and the sovereignty that, you know, is there. Obviously, it's ultimately Christ is the good mm-hmm. shepherd. Christ is the one who has ultimate sovereignty mm-hmm. over his bride, over his uh, church. He's the head of the, the, the church. He's the true shepherd. But as it pertains to what I would call a delegated, uh, you know, oversight, mm-hmm. um, I think that the pastor really has uh, a lot less uh, oversight than he think that I think most are just think that they, mm-hmm. that they have, I would say it probably just pertains only to, you know, that, that which is categorized as, you know, decisions made by pastors as it reflects on the Lord's day, mm-hmm. you know, uh, preaching, preaching the word uh, faithfully, uh, ordaining officers mm-hmm. or other elders and ministering the Lord's supper, mm-hmm. uh, having the oversight over church ministries and things of that nature. But it doesn't extend to the private life, of mm-hmm. Christians in a way where it's like a Christian can't worship Christ freely unless he has the pastor's mm-hmm. authority, yeah. uh, you know, approval from, from his mm-hmm. authority. So mm-hmm. I think practically it just means that, you know, in the matters of soul care, mm-hmm. the pastor is there to mm-hmm. provide oversight mm-hmm. and, and to pastor your soul uh, wh- where it's needed in, in the matters of soul care at the Lord's Day, mm-hmm. soul care um, for p- biblical counseling, mm-hmm. uh, shepherding your heart toward Christ. But it's, I think pastoring should be a lot more freeing mm-hmm. than constraining. You yeah. know? I think you know, Christ loves liberty, and I think mm. he would want pastors that that enjoy when their sheep are are free mm-hmm. in the pasture and free to uh, uh, operate under their, their shepherd without, wa- you know, hey, can I go get a drink of water? Hey, right. is, it, is it okay if I eat this? You, yes, know? Yep. you know, hey, can I go hang out in this area mm-hmm. for so long? And I think that's, when those questions arise, I think oh there's there's a little bit of trauma here because mm-hmm. you wouldn't be asking that question if you were saw how much freedom you have in Christ. Yes. So yeah, practically, I think that I think yeah we were talking earlier like ninety nine point five percent of decisions mm-hmm. do not need to be ran through your yeah. local. Well, that, that that's what I asked you before, and what I was gonna ask you again here for for the record. Uh, you know, I I was uh, throwing out this question to some people. You know, what do you think? 
you need to, what do you think church members need to ask for permission for from their elders? What do you think is appropriate? What do you think is inappropriate for someone to think, oh yeah, I need to, before I do this, before I think this, before I, whatever, I need to ask my pastors if this is okay. What do you think would fall into that category? Yeah, I, I think, like, like I said, this the, the percentage I gave you was like 99.5% mm-hmm. mm-hmm. of stuff does not need the pastor's mm-hmm. approval, yeah. you know? I think what the you know uh, you might need the pastor's approval for is if you wanted to start you know a church uh, a church ministry with the church's name on it mm-hmm. you know I think that would need to go through them because yeah. it's going to reflect the local church yeah. and those things should be you know funneled mm-hmm. through the through yeah the you go church. around announcing to people oh I'm starting an official you know uh, Church of the Cross whatever the name of your church is uh, this is a Church of the Cross uh, Bible study. And but the pastor doesn't what the pastors don't know about yep. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. that's kind of strange because yep. Yep. the the pastors of the church are the official leaders of the church mm-hmm. before God. Yep. What if it's an unofficial thing that you know a guy wants to get together with some of his buddies and study a book and he's inviting people here and there? Do you think that's something that they would need to ask for, for <laughs> no. permission? <laughs> Such a funny question. Yeah. No, yeah. No, I mean, not at all. And uh, I think like a true a secure man in Christ would applaud and, and, and be thankful if that is happening within the context of his local church. You mm-hmm. know, anytime you see a love for the word of God, a pastor should be joyful, not threatened by that. You know, yes. Now, clear, if, you know, I don't know at this point on this scenario, if the brother leading this study was, you know, trying like to start to, you know, include some type of like, oh, this is the official, you know, Christ Redeemer. Church, yes. You know, say, so, hey, like, no, don't worry about that. You yeah. know, just leave titles off of it. Just enjoy mm-hmm. the word, you know? Amen. You could step in and say stuff like that, but you wouldn't need to even pull the study from that mm-hmm. guy and say, hey, what are you doing or something like that. I think yeah. there's even ways to handle conflict when it comes mm-hmm. without it being like, a, you know, like even you're holding these liberties over someone's head. Yeah. Like, hey, don't misspeak or I'm going to pull this random hangout from me or right. something, you know? Right. And I think that happens a lot too, like passive-aggressive yeah. comments. You know, pastors might not say this isn't allowed, but they'll mm-hmm. heavily discourage it or they'll say, they'll make comments that you feel like, oh, am I doing something wrong? Here? Yes. You know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Kind of like that subtle, like scowl that, yeah. that look from a disapproving uh, mm-hmm. person. And hopefully a lot of our listeners just find this conversation fo- very foreign. Yeah. That's, that that's my prayer. They, yeah. They're laughing out loud thinking, you know, wait a second, ask for permission from my elders to study a book from with somebody? That seems extremely strange. Because, yeah, that that's not the type of authority that elders have in right. the local church over their particular, the, the people who have joined the church. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So um, what about like relating to others who leave a church for whatever reason? Would you say, well, first of all, would you say that um, the only... Uh, way that you can leave a church is if you move out of state or something you're moving because of a job or and and then if someone and then secondly if someone does leave the church how do you think the members in that church should relate to the um, person or people who left that one particular local fellowship yeah uh, assuming all things you know are within the about the biblical round of, of christian you know benevolence toward one another Mm -hmm. what i mean to say is as long as the leaving was um not done in sin Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. uh, if that's in place if 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 someone left and i'll get into what that Mm -hmm. might look like if someone left without slandering without Mm -hmm. falsehoods without creating narratives if it was just a clean like hey i I think the lord would you know uh, i can better serve the kingdom of god and glory of god elsewhere yeah and 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 there is that other side that that is is clearly there Mm -hmm. um then i think that that I, i i would say that you know, this isn't a cult or something. Mm-hmm. You know, this isn't like blood in, blood out mm-hmm. type of view of membership. Or, you know, I, I know we joke around about some membership c- mm. uh, certificates yes. out there, yep. you know. But it isn't that. Be thou faithful unto death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So uh, what I would say is that uh, someone um, within the realm of their Christian freedom and liberty could leave a church uh and for for the sake of as you said usefulness in another situation, mm-hmm. uh, maybe they feel like, hey, there's a church that's uh, five minutes from my house mm-hmm. that is a gospel preaching church, 
and uh, you know they're lacking uh, young couples, and mm-hmm. we feel like we, we would bless uh, that mm-hmm. church more, even though we love this church, and you know this church is blessing us. So there's a host of reasons, mm-hmm. a, a lot of reasons I would say that someone could, mm-hmm. in a way that honors the Lord and glorifies Christ, leave a local church, um, without it being weird, mm-hmm. you know. And I think that the church's now reaction to that, uh, both from the pastoral and the, the the membership level, would be. Well, praise God if if, mm-hmm. if you feel like you're honoring Christ mm-hmm. in that decision. Well, praise God. Let let's display unity and love and fellowship and a joy that uh, we are responding to that which Christ has mm-hmm. called us to in our daily lives. You know? Yes. And um, let's do that in a way that represents Christ. Meaning, He's not uh, you know this this person's not leaving us mm-hmm. uh, and leaving the church. Mm-hmm. I think that's a very poor mm-hmm. uh, choice of words. Not leaving yes. the church. They're moving from one local church to another, Mm -hmm. but they've never left the universal church, you know? So even in someone who might have left your local gathering, you should still care for them uh, as much as you can um, in a way that's responsible. And, you know, you're not going to go visit that church every two weeks just to hang out with that person or something. But within the realm of of normal Christian living, it's, hey, check on that brother, Mm -hmm. check on that sister, uh, tell them that you love them, Mm -hmm. you care for them, Mm -hmm. you're praying for them, think about them. Mm -hmm. Uh, still pray for them mm-hmm. even after they're not amongst mm-hmm. you and yeah just kind of be that person's uh even as they go a, a big encourager you know, yes. in their life yeah again i think this comes down to this we're not tribalistic in yes. our view of the, of the local church i love that and it really we're really getting close to the heart of the matter which is always christ yeah and this is all about jesus and if we understand who owns Christians? Who is the owner of a Christian? You know, so often pastors can use the language, like, oh, my sheep, my sheep. And in one sense, yes, it's the sheep that you are entrusted to care for for this specific season, and you're going to give an account for as a pastor for sure. But sheep are owned by Jesus. Yep. He is the one who each and individual Christian is ultimately accountable to, he is the one who directs his people and guides his people through the word and the spirit and certainly through elders and other church mm-hmm. members, but elders are fallible. They don't know everything that's, that's going on. Yeah. They don't know the um, best way that everyone can be used for, for the kingdom of God, for sure. So uh, individual Christians are not owned by local church pastors or by the members of that church. They're owned by Jesus. And as we have a more and more Jesus-centered view of all things, we will recognize that we do our part to love people and to say what we think is biblical, to say what we think is wise um, as, as pastors, and then also as members of the church. You know, Romans uh, 15, you know, uh, I am uh, confident that you are filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. So Christians are able to instruct one another as they have access to the Word of God and as they can speak the, the word of God and apply it to lives of, of, uh, of individuals. Uh, but ultimately each individual person is accountable to Christ for his or her own decisions. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we can't hold on to people as if we think that we own them and we're the ones who can dictate their lives under, under Christ. Would you agree with that? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that another thing that sometimes, uh, Christians downplay, is the reality that we are all spirit filled, yes, yeah, and and we all have been given, uh, yes, sure, a, a measure of grace, but it's not like it's you know there's not a, a class of you know dumb ignorant mm-hmm. Christians that just you need to hold their hand their entire life, mm-hmm. you know. So I, I think that so long as we can remember that we're all spirit filled, meaning mm-hmm. that that Christ is more than able and willing to by His Spirit guide us and to lead us into all truth and to, into maturity. Mm-hmm. That also just kind of puts uh, leadership and um, brothers and sisters in the Lord mm-hmm. in a much better place because you're not you're not assuming that it's your job to micromanage someone's Christian life right and you can instruct and, and encourage and love mm-hmm. and support and say Lord these are your people you yes know? Lord this you know you, you, you died for them mm-hmm. and you're gonna work in them mm-hmm. and it's my job it's not my job to force mm-hmm. that hand you know it's a much it's leading from a much more freeing position yes even you know speaking for myself as a pastor and as an overseer some of the best things for my soul is to know this is Christ church this mm-hmm. is not this is not my church yes this the, the, these are Christ sheep these are as you stated 
yes, in some part, sheep that I will have to give an account for, mm-hmm. but primarily Christ is their shepherd. You know, they shall not want, they, they are spirit filled. They're washed by his blood, you know? And, and, and when I remember that, it's a lot more relaxing and yes. I can now just enjoy life with my brothers and sisters in the Lord as Amen. a sheep amongst them. You know? Yes. Amen. I love that. And unless I sound like, you know, unless I'm miscommunicating and someone's misunderstanding me because of my miscommunication that I'm saying that you shouldn't uh, take counsel from your elders mm-hmm. or you shouldn't involve them in uh, certain decisions or, you know, ask for their, their wisdom and that the Lord doesn't work through elders. That's not at all nope. mm-hmm. what I'm saying. So we don't want to build straw men about what I'm saying. I think that the Bible is very clear and I certainly agree with and believe that we should esteem uh, elders, local church elders very highly. So like first Thessalonians five twelve, we ask you brothers to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. I fully agree with that statement. Amen, and I yeah. believe that everything that I'm saying is fully consistent with that. Yep. There's a difference between esteeming someone highly in the Lord. And there's as Hebrews 13, uh, seven would say that, you know, we, uh, um, uh, follow the example of our elders and imitate their faith. Mm. There's a difference between those things and saying that I blindly obey every single thing that a uh, pastor says to me mm-hmm. at all costs. And if I disappoint him, then it's equivalent to disappointing Jesus. Those are very, two very different things. You can and should uh, give weight to what your pastors say. That is uh, most of the time, an even stronger way to what uh, another church member would say, because the Lord has put these pastors in your life for your own joy yes. and mm-hmm. for your good. Mm-hmm. And they do have real spiritual authority under Christ. Uh, so all of that is real and beautiful and good, and uh, we should respect them highly. But also, in the same respect, uh, church elders, are, local church elders are not infallible. Yep. They are not, they don't have authority over things that are, that the Bible says that they don't have authority Amen. over. Yeah. And um, the, we're not ultimately accountable to a specific group of local church elders, but to Jesus, the, mm-hmm. the chief shepherd. Do you yeah. agree with yeah, 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 100%, that? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And I, I think uh, to further, you know, elaborate on your point, should and must are two different, mm-hmm. way two different things. You know, like if you had a decision about, you know, you want to move, um, to a, a, a church, you know, that's, uh, you know, 30 minutes away mm-hmm. and, you know, you're 10 minutes away. Should you talk to your pastor about mm-hmm. that? Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, must you, uh, probably not in that mm-hmm. situation, mm-hmm. uh, you know, out the, out the gate. Um, or let's just say that you want to, uh, change jobs that are going to, it's going to require you to be outside the house for, mm-hmm. you know, three days uh, a week, traveling, um, around. traveling around, mm-hmm. you know, driving trucks or something. Should you talk to your pastor about that? Yeah, why not? You yeah, know? You, it's yeah. great to seek yeah. counsel yeah. from wise people, yeah. and hopefully yeah. you think yeah. your elders are wise, yeah. so why would you not yeah. go yeah. and seek counsel? You should, should, shock, should talk to your pastors and other brothers and sisters in the Lord. Must you talk to them about the, that decision? No, but of course, you know, this isn't like, um, like we're not at war with each other. Yes. So even going up to a pastor is not like, a, shouldn't be a scary thing yes. to talk about the, uh, that. And that's what I'm trying to get at, is it should be a very free and, and enjoyable mm-hmm community within the local church and a should and must are very different things you yeah. know so so imagine if we get uh, you know continue with our practical discussion imagine i'm a member of your church and uh, of the church where you are a pastor mm-hmm. i should say and um and i think that and i just got offered a job in a different state and i'm uh, weighing of how i'm weighing how it's going to impact my my family if i accept the mm-hmm. the job how it's going to impact my my spiritual growth and my effectiveness for the kingdom of God. And I come up to you and I say, hey, you know, I just got offered this job. Here's the situation. Uh, what do you think I should do? Would you, what would you do? Would you say, oh, I think you should take the job or I think you should not take the job? Or would you look at the scriptures and give the person some things to think through mm-hmm. and ask some questions about their motivations? How would you handle that situation? What do you think is a wise way for a pastor to handle that conversation? Yeah, I, I think a, a pastor needs to be careful with any counsel they give because a lot of well-loving, uh, well-intended uh, Christians tend to take the pastor's word as like the new book of the New Testament, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And they'll equate it with with that level of authority. So I think pastors should have that in the back of their mind as well, and remember liberty of conscience. Mm-hmm. You know, where the Lord has not spoken directly about these things, 
that you you cannot become the lord of someone else's conscience mm-hmm. on these things. So I think if that situation was presented to me, I think I would I would give them some things to chew on mm-hmm. and ask them some questions like, hey, just you know think about uh, something to the effect of, is there a local church, you know, where you, where you're headed, you know, what does the community look like there? Uh, what is you know is the financial um, benefit that you're gaining from this job? How does that correlate to the cost of living in this area? Uh, and just ask them those questions and say, yeah, and just you know think about those things, pray about those things. And how could it impact your marriage? Yep. How, how how have you thought through how it's going to impact your ability to raise your children and discipline social? Yep, social, yep those exactly. Type of yeah, yeah. All from the word, mm-hmm. you know, things that uh, a father is to consider mm-hmm. at all times. Mm-hmm. You know, his family, his bride, his children. Mm-hmm. And uh, leave them with that rather than giving a direct statement of yes or no, rather than giving them some wisdom from the word of things that he should be considering, not just when he's making a big lifetime decision, but mm-hmm. really when he's doing anything. You know, I think that I think is wiser for establishing a healthier mm-hmm. work through and decision making. For instance, I, th- I think in your situation, a father might ask a pastor that, but does a father ask, you know, or think about those things? As he's gonna play two hours of softball, two 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 weeks a night, two days a, a yep. week, you know, away from his family, he's away from his mm-hmm. family. Like, I think he should think about those same questions mm-hmm. uh, in that decision and in the one that moving is moving away. So yeah, I think it's just more fostering mm-hmm. thought that is coming from the word. Mm-hmm. Very very yeah. very good. And then one one last question here before we wrap up, just on on the practical side, what what specifically. Do you think that it is good to have uh, friendships with people outside of your specific local church? And um, if so, why? Or if not, why not? Yeah, and I think important is probably too uh, too weak of a term. I think it's imperative mm-hmm. to have friendships outside our local church. Uh, one, again, to display the glory of Christ in his universal church, in, in you know, in, in those whom he has died for, like, why would we not want? If Christ himself has decided to covenant himself to these people and mm-hmm. to establish a relationship with these people, uh, why would we not desire mm-hmm. the same thing? Are, are we not after what our heart, what our Lord's heart is after, you know? Yes. So I think imperative is there, um, and, and it, it displays the glory of Christ, but also it's for mutual benefit. Mm-hmm. The more that you can expose yourself to the bride of Christ, wherever she is, I think the more encouraged you'll be mm-hmm. to find out that God is that, that that God is working not just in your small world, but mm-hmm. He's working in in so many pockets and, and on the face of this earth, and that'll be encouragement to you. I mean, what what did Paul say? Like, I'm I'm encouraged because your faith is known across this world. Yes. You know, and and He's encouraged to hear that there's more Christians and more Christians mm-hmm. and more Christians because you're saying like, hey, our family is growing, the team mm-hmm. is growing, the kingdom of Christ is advancing. So it's not just uh, important. I think it's imperative. Amen. And a mature mentor once said that uh, a mature Christian is easily edified, mm. meaning, you know, the uh, a mature reformed Christian can look at the uh, the Pentecostal denomination or you know the Assemblies of God and say, "There's some things I can learn yeah. from from these folks," mm-hmm. you know, um, or a uh, uh, reformed a uh, mature reformed christian can look at the confessional gospel preaching lutherans and think hmm you know there's there's some things i could probably learn from these mm-hmm. folks and instead of just thinking unless this person has 99.9% in common with me i can't learn from the person or unless the person is you know part of my same local church i can't learn and help and be helped and glorify christ and display this unity of of the gospel with uh, with this person so I think that we need to keep that in mind. A mature person is is easily edified. And then also, should we have friendships with folks outside of our same local church? Amen. Yes, definitely. That's uh, wonderful. Also, we but we do not want to neglect those inside of our yes. local church. Once again, to not swing that that pendulum. Mm-hmm. That uh, when you look for friendships or people to connect with, don't only look for. Um, worldly things in common mm. you know are you emphasizing things like i can only be friends with people who like the same sport that i do mm-hmm. or who have the same fashion interest or who uh, you know eat to have the same type of diet or exercise mm-hmm. routine and those are the people that i'm going to move toward in my own local church uh, who does christ move toward he moves towards all the people mm-hmm. that he loves 
And as Christians, we are to love all the people that, that he loves. So uh, don't you think in our same local church, uh, it is there's more joy in Christ and greater obedience to him and greater glory that is uh, uh, given to his name when we pursue folks that aren't necessarily the the easiest to love or the easiest folks to spend time with. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that greater displays the, the, the gospel's impact on your life. I mean, Christ says it's, you know, even the Gentiles love those who love them, you mm. know, and we're called to love our enemies, you know. Yep. So if you have some something in someone in your local church that you have nothing in common with, uh, it's I think that's the, the most beautiful way that Christ can get maximum glory because otherwise these people would have nothing in common. Yes. You know, it's it's the you know, the tax collector becoming best friends with the mm. with the with the religious, you know, Pharisee. You yes. know, it's like two worlds that would otherwise hate each other but because of Christ who now mm. are dying for the yep. same master. You know? Amen. We just we just went through that in family worship with our families in Mark three and the calling of the 12 disciples and just how different the 12 disciples were. They weren't these, you know, monolithic monolithic folks that they're all the same and Mm -hmm. uh, how they were all united by the fact that Jesus chose them and they were following Christ in, Mm -hmm. in response. So this is a great conversation. Super helpful. Thank you for, for all of your wisdom and just know that as we look at Christ in his perfect life, in his, substitutionary death in his resurrection as we see and savor him this leads us to love all of our brothers and sisters in christ and those in our specific local church to respect our elders and to ultimately submit to jesus our chief shepherd who is the one who owns us and the one that we are ultimately accountable to amen 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 thanks for joining us for this episode of the gospel liberty podcast 